Okay, so um, today we'll talk about two architects, Daniel Lipskind and Will Alsop. Daniel Lipskind was born on this day of May, 12th of May in 1946, and Will Alsop died on the 12th of May. But I will we'll begin with Daniel Lipskind, a well, very well known architect, and we'll have a very comprehensive uh, overview or view of his works. So, Daniel Lipskin, as you can see, born May 12th, 1946. So he is 76 years old today. Let's wish him happy birthday. He's a Polish American architect, artist, professor, and set designer. Lipskin founded his studio, Daniel Lipskin, in 1989 with his wife, Nina, and is its principal design architect. He's known for the design and completion of the Jewish Museum in Berlin, Germany, that opened in 2001. On February 27, 2003, Lipskin received further international attention after he won the competition to be the master plan architect for the reconstruction of the World Trade Center site in Lower Manhattan. Other buildings that he is known for include the extension to the Denver Art Museum in the United States, the Grand Canal Theater in Dublin, the Imperial War Museum North in Greater Manchester, England, the Michael Lee Chin Crystal at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, Canada, the Felix Nussbaum, Nussbaum House in Osnabrück, <clears throat> Germany, the Danish Jewish Museum in Copenhagen, Denmark, Reflections in Singapore, and the Vold, Vold uh, Center at the Bar Ilan University in Ramat Gan, Israel. His portfolio also includes several residential projects. Lis Lipskin's work has been exhibited in major museums and galleries around the world, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Bauhaus Archives, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris. Here he was as a child in Poland, a uh, virtuoso in playing the harmonica. Uh, and uh, that time, I don't know if he knew he was to become um, an architect, uh, and, but he did. Uh, here he is in, uh, you know, probably around this time, uh, you know, as an over 70 years old man. A little bit uh, melancholy, perhaps. Older age uh, does bring uh, melancholia to those who can afford it. Here he is also a little bit uh, mellowed down. There are other pictures with him, and we are going to see where he didn't mellow down at all. Uh, <laughs> here he seems to look a little bit reluctantly. He has a very successful man uh, with a successful shirt, because this kind of shirt uh, is, um, you know, uh, liked by, by, uh, by famous architects. I know a few others. And here he is with his wife, Nina. And I like this picture of both of them. They, they seem to, be con to continue to be in love and they, they have all the reasons to laugh. And uh, bravo to them. I am sure uh, behind his success, Nina played a role. And sometimes I think, the role of women uh, is not sufficiently acknowledged. And I think we should try to acknowledge it. So let's begin with some drawings. Uh, at one moment, I wrote violently against these drawings. Here I am, including them in a you know, uh, presentation about the works of uh, Daniel Lipskin. I remember that time I, 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 I was infuriated by these drawings because I saw they are cerebral, because they are drawn, uh, you know, uh, either with a you know, rectangle and a T square. Of course, they show a, a maze, and uh, you know, he was considered a deconstructivist, and he was part of the exhibition Deconstructivism in New York City in, I think, 1992, together with other six deconstructivists, Bernard Chumi, Zaha Hadid, Rem Kolkas, uh, Wolf Kriegs, and his partner, that is Kopp Himmelblau, Peter Eisenman, and Frank Gehry. Okay, but 
this kind of drawing, you have to understand, he made them either during his schooling years at Cooper Union in New York, where the dean, when the dean was John Haydock, one of the New York Five, or immediately after the, after the school, when he became actually the dean at the Cranbrook Academy. Uh, but all in all, it shows a very unusual kind of drawing for most schools of architecture. Most schools of architecture would totally discourage this kind of formal exploration. They would not understand it. They would think this is not functional. This is not architecture. Well, this man built more than most uh, the faculty members of most schools of architecture in the world. And he knows how to build and he proved it. Another drawing uh, uh, by him uh, with a certain level of expressionism. Uh, he was, uh, he was, and he is still very interested in music and, um, the, you know, the Jewish Museum in, in Berlin itself was um, inspired by music. This kind of uh, graphic work resembles some avant-garde uh, musical uh, notations or sheets by important avant-garde uh, composers like John Cage or even Yanis um, Xenakis. But again, most schools of architecture will totally dismiss this kind of work because they don't understand it, because they think architecture is just about clarity and lack of uh, you know, uh, too much emotion and lack of uh, exp expressivity and, and so on. And it's not so. Uh, uh, here is a rather opportunistic uh, sketch that he did for, uh, uh, you know, uh, the World Trade Center, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, new, the new World Trade Center and uh, the urban uh, scheme that was uh, in the end to actually win and he won it. But I, I have some doubts about this work of his because even the presence of, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Statue of Liberty, as you can see on the left, it's, it's in my opinion, a little bit uh, strident, this um, declamatory uh, expression of uh, exterior freedom, because freedom is actually of an interior order and any yogi knows it. If you practice yoga, you practice it exactly in order to achieve freedom, inner freedom, it has nothing to do with, with ex exterior freedom with external freedom it's a it's a psychological state It's the state of the soul of the mind and for that you don't need to run you know he even did an artwork uh, uh, a proposal to uh, symbolize um, the devastation that covid the pandemic brought on us by um, you know entrapping uh, the statue of liberty I don't think, again, liberty consists in running wildly on the highway or taking the plane or going to Mars together with Elon Musk. In my opinion, that is not true freedom. Anyway, uh, so, but I like uh, some of his graphic works are excellent and, and uh, those he exhibited a few years ago at the Biennial in Venice. They are also excellent and we are going to see them. Um, I talked with someone who worked in his office in Berlin and uh, I knew actually from pictures that I have seen, he has plenty of books uh, in his office. And uh, this person told me that uh, when he was a little bit younger, maybe a little bit less successful, there was a lot of reading taking place. If you worked for him, you could have picked up a book an art book or a book of poetry or a book from the shelves and uh, you know look through it or read something look at it and uh, this became less and less possible the more successful he became because more works came in and there was no there wasn't so much room any longer for contemplation but even even for that period when this happened i think uh, says something about him but let's start uh, with his uh, this very important um, architectural work, he won this competition, the City Edge competition for Potsdamer's Platz in Berlin in 1993. 
uh, that was, I guess, the, the exhibition um, deconstructivism was uh, probably 1993 or 1994, because um, this work, this particular work, was part of the of the exhibition. And again, if students or professors or assistants or anyone running a conventional architecture school would totally dismiss this kind of work, would say this is not architecture, we don't see plants, we don't see bathrooms here, we don't see kitchens. Yeah, but he won the competition. And, uh, you know, because architecture belongs to culture. And in order to belong to culture, it has to be culturally imbued. When you try to bring a new vision, of course, you don't think about a particular toilet in a particular apartment. You don't, because you are concerned with the larger scheme of things. And, uh, you know, if you are just concerned with banalities, well, you might have, you might have done a correct work, but uh, in terms of vision, empty or uh, insignificant. Uh, he did this uh, because it was Berlin. It, you have to understand, you know, he had a conflictual relationship with Berlin, although strangely, he lives and works in Berlin now, you know, and we all know, I mean, he's from a Jewish family. Well, Berlin, you know what it means. So there is conflict, it's the site of conflict. And for the deconstructivists in general, conflict was very important. It is an architecture of tension, of conflict, of rebellion, of, uh, you know, disjunction. The Jewish Museum in Berlin, which you, uh, you know of, you have seen pictures, I have visited it twice, but I, I never entered, uh, actually, strangely, but the students I went with uh, entered, I mean, I did enter in the hallway, actually, in this part, which he also designed, I mean, the, the roofing of this courtyard, he created it, but this is an existing old building. And to enter the museum, you first enter here and from here, you know, you are connected with, with the museum. Uh, I, I was here, but I never entered this museum. Now I'm beginning to regret. But it's a famous uh, museum by uh, Daniel Lipskind and uh, launched him even further in, uh, you know, in his international successful uh, career. Not far away from this building, there are two buildings by uh, his uh, former dean and professor and, uh, pro you know, uh, I think uh, some kind of a protector, that is John Haydock. From John Haydock's buildings, you can see the, this building by Lipskind and vice versa. Um, so, uh, it's an architecture, again, of, of, of suffering in a way, you know. Uh, it's, it's, there is a courtyard actually here in, in this museum that bears the name of a Romanian poet, Paul Celan, Paul Celan, a great, great, great uh, poet. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, architects don't read poetry any longer, but that's too bad for them. Uh, Daniel Lipskin does. The very fact that he named uh, and I hope I have pictures with it here. Uh, the, the family of Paul Celan, they all died in a concentration camp and Paul Celan threw himself from a bridge in Paris at 50, although he was a successful poet, but he was probably a very traumatized uh, man. And his, his poetry is very, very uh, tense. Um, this is actually the, the, the courtyard. Um, inside this museum. Here it is. This is the, the I think is this one. There is another one. I'm a little bit confused. There are two open spaces. One is um, the Paul Salon courtyard. It might be this one. Now, why, why does he employ this kind of windows? I understood, if I remember correctly, there were either 1,000 or 1,000 or 11,000, could it be 11,000? I, I could be wrong, either 1,000 or 11,000, all different windows. 
no window is identical with another one. Of course, the manner through which he cut, you know, the, the skin of the building is uh, similar, but there are no two identical windows. They're all different. I mean, compare this building to this building. This was supposed to be a building that uh, evoked the tragedy of the Second World War. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an architecture of disjunctions, of conflict. Now, either the other one or this one is the Paul Salon courtyard. Maybe it's this one. I, I have to double check. But one of the two bears the name of, of uh, Paul Salon. Uh, P-A-U-L-C-E-L-A-N, a very, very important poet. In fact, some uh, place him in the vicinity of uh, two of the greatest uh, German poets, Goethe and Hölderlin. I have seen such a work, you know, he, he was placed in the vicinity, you know, together with Goethe and Hölderlin, Paul Celan. Maybe this is the courtyard by, uh, by, uh, by, you know, the Paul Celan, Paul Celan. Uh, I don't know very well how to pronounce. He himself, he was kind of strange. He was living in Paris, but he, he, he was born in former Romania and uh, he knew Romanian, but he wrote in German, which was the language of his oppressors. You know, those responsible for the death of all his family. The critics, the critics ask themselves, why did he write in the language of, 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 of those who provoke so, some, so much suffering to him? Well, of course, Lipskin didn't design the lamp, but the building. Now, the National Holocaust Monument by Daniel Lipskin, Lipskin in Ottawa, Canada, another Holocaust monument. I think here I only have the pro the project, but I think it was built. Yes, it was built. I made this presentation like two years ago or three. In the meantime, it was built. So the critics, the, there are critics who uh, accuse uh, Lipskind that, um, you know, he does repeat himself. And indeed, <clears throat> there are works by him that uh, uses the same manner, so to speak. And, uh, you know, some people accuse him of kind of repeating himself, finding a maniera, which is kind of true, but he replied to them, I don't, I, I don't have time to read them, I have to read important works. But I, you know, it was his defense. The truth is no one likes to be criticized and those who think uh, or claim that they, they are not sensitive to the words of the critics, I think they are, but they just don't acknowledge it. Now the Zhang Zhidong uh, and Modern Industrial Museum. This one is a little bit burlesque. I, 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 it's not one of my favorite buildings by him. I think when he employs curves, he is not very convincing. He also be some skyscrapers, which also use curves, and they, in my opinion, they are they are flaccid. They are not convincing, and this one also. I find it rather burlesque, as I said, with this part. I think he's good with angular architectures, not with, uh, you know, with uh, this, this, this sort of thing. It's, I think it's um, rather superficial. And I think the critics uh, have some reasons for their criticism. But he built it. Um, I don't know. Anyway. It's nice during construction because you see the, the web of the structure, you see the network, if I am to call it so, the, yeah, the web, you know, the knot, the steel knot of the, of the, of the structure, which is, um, you know, has a level of tension and, and, and richness. The drawing, this is, I'm a little bit confused because some of his sketches are rather weak in my opinion, graphically. They are not, even this one is, I would say it's banal actually, but I saw excellent works by him 
as I said, the, the plan is biennial and you are going to see them a little later. Uh, but all in all here, both the drawings and the building, in my opinion, are not great. That's, that's what I think. The drawings are very you know, descriptive and rather predictable. And uh, yeah. Centre de Congrès à Mont in Belgium. Now, of course, he employs this all the time. It's true, the critics are right. You know, he uh, uses this, this uh, all the time. And we are going to see a few other buildings done in the same way. Well, I guess it's not so easy to reju rejuvenate or, uh, yourself uh, continuously. But it's true, there is a level of uh, predictability, not to say superficiality here. And yet some, some of his buildings, I think, are, are um, you know, uh, moving. Yankee Pavilion, this work I like, it was built for China. It's a pavilion, the Chinese pavilion at the uh, Milan uh, exhibition, I forgot in what year, some years ago, and he tried to evoke through the building uh, a dragon, and I think to an extent he succeeded. The only problem is this is the plan, but at the top is cut uh, horizontally, I mean with a perfectly horizontal plane, and I think that's problematic, but the plan, and you'll see the sinuousness of the building, are convincing and interesting. You see, that's what I was trying to, to say. This has nothing to do with the dragon. The, the exterior envelope of the building evokes a dragon and it's, it's, it's uh, you know, dramatic and convincing. But this cut at the top is certainly not organic, it's certainly not a dragon. What happens inside, maybe you don't see. I mean, you don't see from the outside, but here you not only see it, you walk on it, and it's a little bit disturbing, but uh, it's, a, it's a good building otherwise. And if from a certain distance, you don't notice that flat uh, top of the building. Here it is, the Chinese pavilion in Milan, uh, some years ago, maybe, I don't know, five, six years ago or so, uh, during the construction, a lot of steel, of course, but China can afford it. You see again here, the top is, is very artificially and mechanically cut at the top. And I think this is a problem with this building, but otherwise the building is good. And uh, look at the, you know, the, you know, the impeccable uh, execution of this, uh, of these fluid forms, which would not be pass, would not have been possible without, of course, uh, the appropriate technology and software to to prescribe precisely every single spot, because all these pieces that uh, compose this uh, shell of the building are unique. They are not identical. There are slight differences. So you can imagine here the mathematics are, um, you know, uh, astonishing. Again, those who think that are, uh, the computer destroyed architecture, in my opinion, are wrong. In the right hands, used properly, the computer is helping architecture to achieve forms of architecture that before you couldn't even dream of, you couldn't even imagine, and you couldn't draw. And now you can draw them and you can build them. I mean, who would have thought in the past, the remote past, to, to make a building like a dragon? You know, not many people. So, you know, there are people who invoke uh, former communism in some countries that we cannot develop because communism was not too far away from us. It's not true. It's simply not true. China had a more uh, alarming form of communism than any other country. And look, they commissioned Daniel Lipskin to build a, a pavilion. Plus they have plenty of talented and risk-taking architects today, the Chinese. China at this point is the, the most experimental country in architecture. And they had communism just like us, but they changed very quickly. 
and they changed very quickly because they understood that in the absence of assuming technology at the highest level, they cannot progress. And they are far now, exactly because of this understanding. China would not have created what they create now if they kept working with a T-square and a rectangle, no. But also the appreciation for many Westerners like Daniel Lipskind to build for them within the country and outside the country like this was built in uh, Milan, but it was built for China. They commissioned him. Now the Serpentine Gallery in London, unfortunately this presentation doesn't have the year of the constructions, it's a minus in my presentation and I apologize. Like other famous architects, he was invited to build the Serpentine um, Pavilion and he did. This is what he did. Now, maybe I should have had a few more pictures here, but again, his architecture is not so dramatically different from one project to another. So I think you can imagine, even based on one picture, how this pavilion actually looks like. The new Lithuanian Modern Art Center, this was a project, I don't think he built it yet. And here he is with the authorities in Lithuania. Um, you know, unveiling the model to use uh, uh, a fashionable word today, unveiling. This is the project. Now the two Kurdistan Museum, I, I included also lesser works, lesser known works by him. The Kurdistan Museum in Erbil. Uh, again, in all these projects, we see conflict, we see tension, we see you know, uh, ripping apart certain parts of the building. And this is a trademark for him. Unfortunately, he also designed this tower in Jerusalem, which I find problematic because it's so monolithically self-centered and self-assured that I think this is in contradiction with everything he stood for before and maybe after. And look at the banality, not to say the conformism, the conventionality of this part of the building. You know, you almost think this was done by Philip Johnson, not by uh, Daniel Lipskind. We are going to see other pictures with this project. It was not built and I'm happy it was not built. And I would be even happier to know that it will never be built. On the other hand, Herzog and de Moron proposed something kind of similar for Paris. This uh, giant, uh, you know, megalomaniacal uh, triangular uh, pyramid uh, that uh, celebrates what? Vilnius Beacon, uh, another work uh, project which was not built in Vilnius. He did many projects, many competitions, many everything. Uh, here he is laughing to death. Of course, he is laughing. Who wouldn't laugh in his, in his place? You know, he, he is a short man, but his wife is even shorter. And yet they are happy and they have a lot of vitality because it worked. It worked, the, the path they chose in life. Uh, here he is. Hello, nice watch. Uh, Casa Origami. Uh, this is, a, <laughs> this is a, you know, an engaging in a way, um, you know, uh, model house that he built on the ground of, I don't know, some exhibition or so it's, but you'll see the bedroom. The bedroom is in my opinion, problematic because the bedroom shows in a way his other side, the conventional side, the petit bourgeois, and even maybe the pathetic side. The, the exterior of the building is engaging indeed, but um, inside is a different story. I hope I have a picture with it here. But again, you know, this could have been the Serpentine Pavilion, right? It's not so different. Uh, instead, it's a house. Uh, or it could have been if it was larger, a museum or a, I don't know what else, you know, cultural center, anything. Yes, 
There are interesting things happening here, but when you look at this picture, you wouldn't really call it a home, would you? And this was supposed to be a home. Well, it has a publicness about it, which makes it a little bit uh, difficult to perceive as a home. But <laughs> he tried to make up for it uh, with a bedroom here. To my, I mean, I'm really sorry, this presentation is supposed to be an homage to him, but this interior to me is pathetic, you know, with those uh, two lamps left and right and the two pillows and not to speak about the uh, pathetic, uh, you know, blanket. And it's just, uh, you know, this is, this is what the construction is supposed to have at the interior. I mean, if you would have placed this bed, you know, inside a rectang rectangular room, you know, a banal room, it would have, it would, it, it would have felt more natural. But here in this building, you look at this building, you know, with it like this, and then inside you find this. Uh, I, I think it's a contradiction, and also. This I also noticed in in a, in the in a hotel that uh, Frank Gehry built in Spain is the same thing. You know, it's like the construction is supposed to express even anger, you know, uh, disjunction, conflict, tension, uh, inadequacy, many things. But when you place this kind of you know voluptuous king size or queen size bed. You know, covered with that uh, faux animal skin or whatever it is, it looks so. I mean, I feel like uh, psychoanalyzing this. Otherwise, of course, the, the 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 plan of the house is engaging, is dynamic, is uh, you know uh, conflictual, but uh, this is not. Anyway. So what's the meaning of this thing here? You say, my God, my God, is a revolutionary who lives here, right? Only a revolutionary would have such a house. But what is revolutionary about this? <laughs> Nothing. Anyway, there are contradictions in anyone's life, so let's not be too harsh. Um, I'm not so sure he knows very well how to build a home. Actually, you know, this is uh, rather graphic and uh, a cold manner graphic. I don't know if I describe properly what I want to say. It's still interesting from the outside, particularly, and maybe the inside too. This is an earlier work by him, and I like this one. It's a museum for a painter, Felix Nussbaum, uh, well, house in Osnabrück in Germany. I almost had a chance to have an exhibition there for um, a house for Albrecht Dürer, a competition I launched many years ago. And uh, we almost made it to inside this very museum in Osnabrück. But in, in the end, it didn't happen. Uh, I forgot for what reasons. Anyway, this is the, it's like in the case of the uh, Jewish Museum in Berlin, uh, he was to handle the proximity of an existing building, this one. So he proposed this building uh, for this uh, painter, for his works. And I think it's a good work. I also like the fact that here, like Louis Kahn, is employing this, um, you know, aging wood for the facade. And I think the patina of this um, portion covered in wood is nice. And uh, unfortunately, he didn't use, and in general, the deconstructivists didn't use, you know, natural materials too often or, or uh, organic materials. There are interesting things happening here, but still somehow within the same manner of doing, uh, uh, doing architecture. Lipskind in New York. Now here he is, you see him with a, his proposal for the, World Trade Center, he is, here is the, the former uh, governor of New York, uh, Bloomberg, and uh, no, no, he was the mayor, I think, and this was the governor of New York, 
and who else is here? Lots of uh, you know uh, news uh, people, uh, media people, and so on. Uh, in the end, the tower was not built by him; was built by uh, SOM, Skidmore, Rowing, and Merrill, David, David Child. Uh, and, but he he did have a world. Uh, I mean, he he made the master plan, which apparently you know was kind of respected, at least to an extent. So he had a role in uh, in uh, in New York in uh, designing this area, uh, this very important and traumatized area of Manhattan. Uh, here they are, you know. What is funny is that, in fact, nothing should have been funny because this was about a tragedy, you know, September 11. But they are all smiling and laughing, with the exception of. Uh, Fumihiko Maki, the Japanese architect who did build a skyscraper here. But all the others, this is the developer, this is the governor of New York, this is Lipskin, this is Sir Norman Foster who, who couldn't miss the occasion, and here is Sir Richard Rogers. They all laugh. I don't understand. How could they laugh when more than 3,000 people died there and uh, you know the, the great losses of, of, of New York? were indeed great. Uh, I often have questions about the sensitivity of architects. This was his project, you know, and uh, yeah, he made references to the, the year of, uh, you know, the, the, when the United States became the United States, a free country, and all kinds of, in my opinion, rather ex external and rather a little bit rhetorical, not to say demagogical, justification for his uh, for his proposal in the end was not built in the end was built the one by uh, SOM uh, with uh, David Child as, as the designer is this tower here this is the new World Trade Center this is of course um, uh, uh, BRK Ingels couldn't miss the pie either so he proposed but was not built and I, I don't know uh, which one is, maybe this one uh, for Mihiko Maki, I uh, forgot who this one is. Anyway, uh, and here is the memorial to the, to the victims. Uh, I don't know, I don't know what this is. Um, I don't know if he made this. There were all kinds of proposals at the time for this uh, area former World Trade Center. This is the, the new World Trade Center that replaced the fallen towers, the twin towers, a sketch by him for... I, 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 I don't know exactly. Maybe he's not doing all the works himself because these sketches, I mean, this is signed by him, but this kind of sketch is weaker artistically than the works which I, I'm going to, to see later. Here is a picture of the man in his office uh, with the many books he has. Uh, and I'm glad he has many books around him. Uh, I know he advocated culture. He advocated and advocates an architecture that is culture, that belongs to culture. But he also has, like anyone, I guess, you know, sometimes uh, uh, strange, um, you know, a strange taste, like uh, his shoes. The, they are cowboy boots made of a uh, um, lizard uh, skin, you know, crocodile skin, uh, a leather. I, I, I don't know. I find it a little bit, um, a little bit, a little bit funny, so to speak, or strange or um, awkward. Um, anyway, Denver Museum of Art, Again, the same piercing, uh, you know, triangle towards the sky, which is literally indifferent to our attempts to, to scratch it. Um, maybe this kind of architecture should be called uh, a sky scratcher. Um, yeah. He does repeat himself sometimes, and it's regrettable because he does have uh, something to say, and he has uh, he has the talent. Uh, fortunately, he does. Fortunately, he doesn't do it all the time, but um, he does insist. 
it's true. And I think the critics were right. Sometimes, you know, he's uh, too, uh, you know, uh, much underlining a certain formal theme, which becomes a graphism, you know, it's like saying the word love too many times and that it becomes, you know, irrelevant because it loses its, uh, its power. Life, it is not just a series of calculations and the sum total of statistics. It's about experience. It's about participation. It is something more complex and more interesting than what is obvious. I would agree with him, yes. Yes, that's why I don't think uh, the obsession with facts and with calculations uh, is, uh, is doing any service uh, to architecture. He also says architecture is not based on concrete and steel and the elements of the soil. It's based on wonder. Yeah, are we creating buildings that provoke wonder? Other schools of architecture encouraging students to promote, to generate, to give birth to wonders. Unfortunately, some are not. Maybe, maybe, maybe more. Maybe many are not. And this is very sad because as a Romanian poet, Stefan Augustin Doina said, only what is a wonder merits, deserves to, to exist. But unfortunately, many people think that only what is uh, uh, common uh, deserves to exist. And I, I don't think so. Now, what do you make of this smile? Well, he made it, what can we say? He made it, he made it, imagine, you know, you saw him as a kid playing the harmonica in, I don't know, in Krakow, I think in Poland. And then he arrives to handle uh, the most important matters in Manhattan, in New York, and not, not only in Manhattan, in New York. The Museum of Contemporary Art in Milan, uh, it's a project, he didn't build it, uh, rather similar uh, to that um, pavilion uh, built for China, also in Milan, but bigger. Uh, it was not built yet. Leonardo fragmented there. Uh, the spiral, the dragon, the crystals for MGM, Mirage, 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 Mirage City uh, Center in Las Vegas. Now, this to me is a work which shows to me how uh, capable Lipskin is to negotiate or to even uh, become complacent when the need is with the most, uh, actually, I would say disturbing, uh, realities of commercial and uh, mundane uh, life, you know. I mean, of course we have, uh, you know, Las Vegas, although I wonder if we should. We, uh, we know we have uh, department stores and malls, but I was expecting, uh, you know, an architect like, like uh, Lipskin to, I mean, you know, he designed the, uh, the Jewish Museum in Berlin. He designs, uh, designed other Holocaust museums. And he uses kind of the same architectural language for the very opposite. That is, you know, uh, malls. This is a giant, uh, you know, entertainment center, if we are to call it a center. It's a, it's a mall, a giant uh, mall, that's it. And where in the in, in the capital of um, you know uh, losing uh, one soul because Las Vegas is uh, the capital of uh, cheap entertainment. I mean cheap morally, but not cheap uh, financially, because it's a it's 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 a place one can never uh, learn from something that matters. That's why I'm totally against the title of that famous book, Learning from Las Vegas. What can you learn from Las Vegas? Because, because it's, 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 it's clearly, it's a, it's a mirage indeed. It's a, it's a, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fake thing. It's a fake city. It, it's meant to take your money in the casino. That's what it was built for. And it's, it's, uh, it's about um, 
delusions, illusions and delusions. I had lost some money myself in a casino in Atlantic City. So I never went to Las Vegas, but I imagine it's not such a big difference. Now look at this staircase. In my opinion, it's banal. It's banal, but uh, you know, they have the money, they built it. It's not a work I would be proud of. Uh, it, there is no uh, critical resistance here. There is no, uh, yeah, there is no more moral standing here. And, uh, you know, uh, yes, I understand the architect, if, if he wants to build, has to say yes and not question on moral grounds anything, but I, I, I'm not happy with this. I think an architect should uh, express some deeper thoughts, even when building a, uh, you know, a casino or a, or a entertainment center or a huge mall in Las Vegas. After all, what is the difference between these towers and his building? Uh, this one mimics some kind of a uh, formal anxiety, but which is of a graphic order. In essence, they all celebrate the same thing. Let's get lost. Let's sell our soul for a little uh, thrill by playing the roulette and uh, spending then if we win, if we win, spend it quickly in the, in the uh, mega, uh, you know, spending center built by uh, Daniel Lipskin, by I don't know what, some stupidities, you know, designed by high-end designers or not. Uh, is anyone asking, well, you know, we talk about the climate change, we talk about the excesses of anthropos, of the human being, you know, look at how much electricity is being consumed here for what? For what? To forget that there are stars on the sky? That's the reason? Or to transform the night into day? I, I have my limits of acceptance towards this sort of thing. Now, origami swan, this is, a, you know, uh, he played with paper. Yeah, there is a, a liking for the origami. Now, other people invoke the or, origami. He is not the only one. Now, he also, his architecture is not so unique. Yakov Chernikov, about whom we talked the other day, was a constructivist Russian um, architect and who mainly drew, uh, did, for example, this drawing in the 1920s. You know, it's it's an anticipation of what we call later deconstructivism. Um, so now the Kurdistan Museum in Iraq, another work which was projected but was not built. The pyramid in Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem, we already saw, but here I have other pictures. This one we did see. Another one. This is almost identical, seen from here. We, actually. I think I'm wrong. This actually is not his work, it's the one by Herzog and de Moron, yes. So this is in Jerusalem. And the, maybe when I made the presentation, that's what I wanted to show. This is by Daniel Lipskin in uh, Jerusalem. This is by Herzog and de Moron in Paris. And they received the approval to, to build this. Uh, and this, yeah, that's, that was my intention. And this is in North Korea in the capital of North Korea. Now, back, Jerusalem, uh, Daniel Lipskind, uh, the pyramid in Paris by Herzog and de Moron, and I don't know who built this, uh, you know, uh, immodest uh, hotel uh, in, uh, in the capital of North Korea. Uh, sketches by him we already saw for the World Trade Center. Hello, Mr. Lipskind, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. This one is one of his best works, in my opinion, although he repeats the same themes. But I think it's done uh, with more exuberance and more convincingly. And uh, I'm happy that they built it. You know, uh, I mean, if a student this, did this kind of drawing or project, would have been dismissed by most professors. This man built it. Not only that he drew it, he built it. And he built it in Toronto. So bravo to Toronto for being open-minded. And you see, they didn't have trouble at all 
to accept a conflictual relationship between the the part the the intervention of Daniel Lipskind and an older building that was there. And it's also part of the museum. Again, like in Berlin, uh, he's uh, good at uh, attacking an existing building or an existing situation. That's what I meant when I said his architecture is an architecture of conflict. Uh, but this building, I think, uh, visually, artistically, sculpturally, is uh, one of his best. Without him giving up on his manner of doing things. But again, this is in Toronto. Bravo to Toronto. In my opinion, uh, uh, the city and the administration of the city should, uh, uh, should receive some applauses that they were not stiff and they were not conventional and that they accepted this proposal. You see here the existing building and what he did here, you know. Uh, it does pay to, to take risks, you know, it does, it does. If you have something to say, do it wholeheartedly with courage and then see what happens. But most importantly is to be sincere, to express what you truly feel and stand by it. Uh, you know, you might be criticized, you might be dismissed, that, but at least, you know, you expressed yourself as you feel. Uh, and it's important to, to, to be honest as much as possible and stand by it by your honesty. This is a sketch he did for the, uh, this is a better sketch, I think, by him. Uh, views from the interior. Now the winning design for Canadian National Holocaust Monument in Ottawa, uh, we saw already, uh, but I don't have pictures of it as it was built and it was built. This one I saw from far away when I visited Cincinnati uh, for a few hours. Uh, I liked it and I, I like it uh, from, you know, seeing it uh, publicized. It's an apartment building. And, uh, you know, it has an unexpected expression is uh, totally unexpected, uh, unexpected and perhaps even inappropriate for a city like Cincinnati in the southern part of, uh, of, of the United States. But it's not uh, that uh, anxious uh, expressionism of uh, the German art and architecture of the beginning of the 20th century. So I guess, uh, you know, it, it could be accepted. It's an apartment building. Of course, it's an apartment building for those who can buy an apartment. There. And uh, you can imagine not everybody could uh, live in, 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 in this building designed by uh, a famous architect, by Daniel Lipskin. Those who think that form does not matter in architecture are wrong. I mean, architecture is a visual art. It's not only visual, but it is, at least in part, a visual art. But what would you do without form? Why is architecture present in any history of art? Well, because at its best, it becomes an art. That's why. And take any book on the uh, history of science, and architecture is not there. I never saw a history of science with architecture there. But most histories of art that I saw show architecture, and plenty of it. Keppel Bay, Singapore, the thrill of wealth, I wrote, maybe a little bit uh, envious. And who wouldn't be envious? I mean, look at this beautiful pair, you know a white sweater on the shoulders, you know, and the breeze you can imagine and the, the, and the ship with, uh, you know, advancing uh, slowly not to disturb the romance and one shoe of the ladies uh, disappeared. Uh, I, what can we say? The good life, idyllic waterfront living by the marina, you know? <laughs> But again, you know, this is the, I mean, Lipskin built here uh, some buildings 
uh, which, um, in my opinion, uh, have absolutely nothing to do with. Uh, now maybe he forgot. Maybe you know he said, "Okay, uh, for the Holocaust, we build a certain architecture, uh, for and for the idyllic waterfronts uh, in Southeast Asia, we build something else." Here we see an example, in my opinion, of um, questionable architectonically speaking, architecturally speaking, skyscrapers. In, I didn't yet see a convincing skyscraper imagined or built by Daniel Lipskin. He built this, but I consider them flaccid. You know, they are. You know they are a little bit curved, and they are. I, I don't want to psychoanalyze them or uh, analyze them even further. But uh, I personally wouldn't like to live in one of these skyscrapers. Let's put it in this way: they are contrived. You know, they are. To me, the essence of a skyscraper is to be vertical. When they are like this. They are, I'm not against doubting. In fact, this year, there are 100 years since the most important, some people think, uh, competition in architecture of the 20th century for the Chicago Tribune from 1922. So it's the centennial. And I even wrote a text towards a new kind of verticality. But here, I don't see actually a, a, a different kind of verticality, or I don't know, I didn't visit the place but from the pictures I look at, I find them, um, I don't know, uh, almost uh, somehow a little bit hypocritical. Uh, that's what I feel. Uh, another people, another person could feel differently, but I, I, I still think his skyscrapers are, uh, even the sketch, this sketch that he did, I find it rather unsatisfying. And this is a man, again, if, if those works are his, what he showed at the Venice Biennial and you are going to see are excellent, graphically speaking. Here he is, I like this picture of him, you know, he's like a, almost like a teenager, like a kid, you know, playing with a, uh, and with a certain uh, expression of, uh, you know, co uh, contemplative, uh, of a contemplative mode, which I like. And the, what do we see from all the books on the shelves? The one that uh, is oriented with the cover towards us is a portrait of Edgar Allan Poe, the great dark, dark and very dark North American poet. Uh, this does say something, you know, that all these books, only this book is facing us and with the, the recognizable portrait of Edgar Allan Poe. Well, what does Edgar Allan Poe have to do with this picture? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Edgar Allan Poe died at 40, 40 something, uh, you know, uh, destitute poet and, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, you know, the fringe of society. And here we have the summum of success. Here are two people, the successful architect and the successful developer, you know, uh, rising there, and, you know, uh, a significant, uh, uh, you know, finger because it worked. They sold the, all the apartments and the architecture is splendid, they think. Uh, I am not so convinced, but now, the towers are rather, um, in my opinion, uh, questionable. Because this is not about modesty. I think a skyscraper, in order to flirt with modesty, if I, if I am to say so, doesn't grow so high. And it doesn't, I mean, here is an hesitation which but it's not even an hesitation. I, I don't know if I'm now uh, sufficiently inspired to describe what I feel when I, when I look at these skyscrapers. I can only uh, uh, you know, conclude what I already said. I wouldn't like to live in any of these towers.
Hello, Mr. Lipskin. Happy birthday to you again. Now the cabin Metro Hotel. Uh, yeah, it could have been a mall, a department uh, store of large dimensions in Las Vegas or somewhere else. It, it happens that it's a hotel. Uh, <laughs> these are his cowboy boots with leather made of li lizard, lizard uh, skin, lizard uh, leather. I don't know. I find it uh, a little bit awkward. I confess. I confess. Uh, Sonnets of Babylon. But this is the work which I like very much graphically. Uh, at the Venice Biennial, and I had seen it, and it was impressive then, and it is impressive in the pictures here. But I see a different kind of work from, from what I saw in those sketches. I don't know. I don't know, how could he be so different? These were excellent, I love them. I don't know the, I don't know how he did them. I don't know, I didn't read the text. There is a text because he did something about Venice. Well, what does Venice have to do with the Babylon? I don't know, but graphically, I like them very much. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, you know, a maze of forms that is intriguing, is organic. There are, you know, mysterious skeletons here, forms. Uh, I, I like this work by, um, by Daniel Lipskin very much. Well, this is what happens. If you have success, you are invited to major exhibitions, you are invited to build, you have options, you can express yourself, in many ways, this is what, you know, a life of intense creativity and non-conformism leads to. Unfortunately, in his case, also led he, uh, he, he it led to, you know, uh, building uh, those things in Las Vegas and in uh, Southeast Asia, you know, for idyllic uh, what uh, so-called adventures. It's difficult to stay away from mundane matters when you have so much success. Um, now, this is a picture of him now, or approximately now, as a grown-up man, but maybe there is still a kid in him. And this is the kid that you saw earlier in 1955. So he was, um, uh, let's see if I add uh, correctly now, I think he was born in 1946, so uh, nine years old playing the harmonica. I was still laughing and I like him very much in this picture, you know. Um, so let's, uh, let's uh, read a little bit about what he said. Developing architecture beyond the traditional tautologies we are given historically, an architecture that is dynamic and moving forward and operating in a new set of interests that are not just old modernist interests, but have to do with history, culture, literature, philosophy, with art in general. It is an exploration of creativity and the humanistic tradition of architecture, which means that architecture is of course a scientific field, a technical field, but it is equally part of the humanities in the sense of ideas, philosophy, literature, poetry, geometry, astronomy, and so on. Archetizer, it was an interview, him asked him, what is your advice for young architects who might be in this experimental stage now as they progress to bigger projects and spaces? Well, the question was, uh, you know, referring to those young architects who do experimental work. Unfortunately, not every young architect and certainly not every student does experimental work because it's not encouraged and is not advised and so on. Take the risk, beautiful. Take the risk, that's how he begin. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot read, uh, I hate this about this tab. I, 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 I can't read the whole text, it's covered by an information from Zoom uh, that, um, Ah, I truly hate this. I truly hate this. I cannot read the text because of a stupid taskbar. Don't just get involved in the buildings. So again, this is said, this is said by Daniel Lipskind to the question, 
what advice do you give the young architects and students? So he said, take the risk. Don't just get involved in the buildings, but pursue your ideas for your development, even if it doesn't just have an immediate application. At the same time, I think that experiment is really fantastic because it does lead you if you follow that path very rigorously and in a very disciplined way. I put a great value on this. Actually, I wouldn't call it experimental because experimental is more scientific. It either works or it doesn't. I would call it more of an adventure in the pursuit of your passion for architecture. And that will certainly lead you. If you are not surrounded by cynics, but by people who share your ideas and can discuss them with you, it's the best way to lead young architects to fantastic things. I so regret that besides me now, there are only three other people, although I invited more than 2000. I so regret this because they don't hear this message from Daniel Lipskin and they keep following the wrong path in architecture and they will arrive nowhere except to banality, but that is the nowhere by, par excellence. I always tell young architects, pursue what you dream about. Don't be discouraged by cynics or skeptics. Surround yourself with interesting people. Keep the going. You just have to have passions. There is no rush. It's not about quantity, it's about quality in my life anyway. I had been lucky, I could have expanded and doubled the amount of people. We had so many projects, but I said, no, let's not expand. Let's keep it so it's about architecture and not mass production. If I was not working on every project, if I was not involved fully, I, would, I wouldn't want to do it. It wouldn't be fun. So again, I always tell young architects, and I include here myself here, the students, pursue what you dream about. Dream about you, not someone else. Don't be discouraged by cynics or skeptics. Surround yourself with interesting people. Keep going. You just have to have patience. There is no rush. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. Okay, and now we go to the second architect today. Uh, an architect uh, almost completely unknown in my country, and it's a shame, but this is what great indifference leads to, ignorance. Will Alsop, 1948, 2018. William Allen Alsop was born in December 1947, but he died on this day, the 12th of May, 2018 was a British architect and professor of architecture at university for the Creative Arts Canterbury School of Architecture. He, he was responsible for several distinctive and controversial modernist buildings, which are usually distinguished by the use of bright colors and unusual avant-garde forms. In 2000, Alsop won the Sterling Prize, the most prestigious architecture award in the United Kingdom for the Peckham Library in London. That's the art of, our, art of architecture, putting everything together in your own way. That's what he said. That's the art of architecture. Yes, art of architecture, putting everything together in your own way. Here he is. He was a very important architect, a very good architect, and also an artist. And uh, we need more examples like him. But how can we destroy the horrible indifference that surround us? How? People prefer now to watch uh, soap operas or I don't know what stupidities on TV instead of learning now about an important British architect. It's a shame. Drawings, paintings, because he started many, proje many projects by painting. That's how he started his building activity, through painting. Uh, this uh, drawing, okay, it's not uh, very moving, but he did all kinds of uh, uh, interesting visual works. Look, look, uh, he, he did this large, it's clearly an artwork. 
and it's too bad. I should have had here, if you search on the web, will also paintings you can see, and I should have had more paintings. And I'm actually angry at myself that I didn't review this presentation, which I had made um, two or three years ago to add more paintings. Maybe then for the next um, paying homage to him, I will do so. China Smart 21st Century City, it's a project. Um, he, sometimes he has a little bit of a pop mentality, but he's very creative, innovative in terms of for making, for giving, for giving and very free. Urban Renewal, Bradford, um, it's, it's a project which he didn't build. You see here his, uh, his proposals in a highly, you know, a historical uh, context. He proposes, um, you know, modernistic, uh, to say the least. That's a moderate uh, word, modernistic uh, structures. Cricket stand at and university campus. He built it. Um, it's not bad. It's not bad. Uh, it's uh, cricket is important in Great Britain, and uh, you know they have the money and uh, they hire uh, important architects to build. Uh, you know what you see here, for example. Will also. This is not an outrageous building, but still shows creativity and the desire for the new. We are going to see more outrageous buildings from this architect who died on the 12th of uh, May uh, in 2018, so four years ago. Hotel du Département, Hotel du Département, 1994. I forgot in what city in France. Toronto Apartments Offices, a project which was not realized, but is interesting. You know, if you consider its duality, the the embroidered uh, volumetry or uh, you know uh, elevations of the bottom uh, part of the building with the top floating as it is, it was not built, but will arrive at some built works too. Don't worry. He did all kinds of things and he was a designer, a professor, a painter, an architect who built, I don't know if, if this is in his office, I see a bicycle there, someone across the tab, huge table from him, a sketchbook on in front of him and then uh, artworks, paintings on the walls because the man painted, he loved to paint. And uh, not only uh, to paint, he did all kinds of artworks. The Ford Children's Center from 2004, he loved color. Uh, yes, the, maybe the, the pop uh, uh, sensitivity or sensibility, you know, some might uh, look at it uh, maybe a little bit uh, critically, but it's also a virtue in a sense that he was not stiff. He was not, uh, you know, a, a, an intimidating intellectual, you know, trapped into his, uh, you know, his little or not so little obsessions. Plus, this was, this was meant for children. So uh, there is something, uh, you know, uh, even if you didn't read the name of the building or the program, you kind of understand immediately that it's, it's, it's an environment for children. It's playful, it's uh, heterogeneous, it's hybrid, uh, you know. Palestra, 2006. Uh, I don't know what this is, an office building. Will also. Projects in China. I like, uh, I like this very much. It was built, again, China, former communist country. So those countries who keep justifying the banality, the mediocrity because of a communism which uh, collapsed <clears throat> more than 30 years ago are simply hypocritical. China was communist and more stringently communist <clears throat> than uh, other countries and look what they built. 
Yes, with the help of sometimes, because now they have plenty of uh, excellent architects themselves, but they invited uh, important architects from the West and they all built and look what they built. Will also, in a way, uh, with, with such a project, uh, Will also is, um, is uh, challenging, you know, the, the supremacy of uh, Daniel Lipskin. I mean, there is a level of creativity and exuberance here that is in no way inferior to the one displayed in the best works by Daniel Lipskin. Uh, I like what I look at, you know. Yes, the art of architecture, bringing the things together in your own way. Uh, towards the outside, okay, maybe there is too much glass, but then he's not the only one to use it. Um, Almir, another, you know, building on sticks. Um, we have seen such architecture. He's not so unique in this. But at his best, I think he produced some engaging, interesting works. And yes, as I said, he begins his work, he began his work by painting, Shanghai Kiss. I don't know what this was supposed to do, to, to be actually, you know, uh, some kind of a sculpture. Uh, a sign for the great city of Shanghai, uh, it was not built. But again, we, we see a risk taken, just like uh, Daniel Lipskind recommended uh, everyone and particularly the young architects to, to be like and to do. Xi'an Hotel, uh, some sketches, uh, it's a project. Or it's a, I am, yeah, it's a project, but then we see the silhouettes, yeah, they, they, it's a project, but uh, if you didn't see those human uh, silhouettes uh, graphically represented, you could have been sure almost that it's, it's a built work. Here it's clear, it's a, it's a rendering. A look at the unusual plan. He is, at times he was quite um, surprising, maybe even to himself. Too bad it was not built. But in a certain way, maybe he took more risks than uh, Daniel Lipskin, who kind of repeated himself with his, uh, you know, uh, scratching the horizon or scratching the, 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 the sky. Here we see maybe, you know, uh, an architecture taking risks, but sometimes uh, with uh, certain hesitations, uh, but still, I, I, I think he, um, he surprised not just us, but also himself sometimes. Colorium 2001, an office building is the one here, of course, uh, and uh, Colorium it is, if Colorium comes from color, uh, and color it is, I don't know what those are, some references to some flags, or I, I don't know. The interior, hmm. although on the ceiling we see a lighting system that is not very different from the, you know, the graphics of Daniel Lipskind. Um, yeah, the Puddle Dock Hotel, another proposal which was not built, but we are going to see also other buildings that, that he did build. Hello, sir. Will also a project for London is this one. We see here St. Paul Cathedral. Christopher Wren, of course, was not an architect, but built at least 40 churches and cathedrals only in London, not to speak about the other kinds of buildings and not to speak about other buildings built outside of London. An incredible man, uh, Christopher Wren. Abu Dhabi Hotel. Um, a project, uh, I don't know what's on the right, some kind of a wild sketch, that's how he used to work, you know, we create these uh, half paintings, half imaginings of possible buildings, maybe he drank something before he did those, I don't know, La Fosca, another work, um, interesting if it would have been built, 
look at um, you know this um, uh, you know scribble here you know and even the skin of the building is uh, interesting you know there are suggestions here of, uh, of interesting things happening uh, too bad it was not built when you free your creative energies when you work with joy and intensity emotion beautiful things could come into being but you have to have the courage of expression raffle city uh, these are built um, yeah well again these are not so 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 unique but still they show skill and there are interesting parts of the building like this one for example with this uh, swim pool swimming pool under this uh, very interesting roofing will also And yes, we have to say it, ornamentation is present in various ways, here in one way, here in another way, uh, because architecture is not their structure. Raf Lux Hotel, interesting, Raf Lux, usually what is luxurious, or Lux is not Raf. I don't know exactly what's going on here. Uh, it was built, it's a smaller work not uh, large uh, dimensions but uh, we still feel uh, that the energy the creativity and the lack of conventionalism of this uh, british architect named will also the public um, another work by him i forgot where this was built uh, it's this building here uh, some kind of a um, you know hub for creative uh, energies you see here again the the, the pop uh, sensibility uh, and i think uh, this work is is very interesting and uh, i'm sure it functions very well it's, it's some kind of a large space for all kinds of uh, uh, creative activities and um, this man i think uh, promoted a certain joie de vivre didn't he through his architecture Zuhai, another project which was uh, which was which was not built, but kind of interesting. And in fact, uh, you know, maybe some parts of this roofing uh, can be uh, seen uh, in a in a built work by Jean Nouvel for the Louvre Museum in Abu Dhabi, or is it in Dubai? Maybe Abu Dhabi. I always confound the, the two. Remember, he died in 2018, so he did his works until then. But even this one, I think, uh, it could have been interesting if it was built. What is this? Gao Yang again, probably China, 2009. Yeah, we already saw pictures of this, and it's one of the favorite, my, fav my favorite works from his oeuvre. Uh, because it is, uh, look at this, it's, it's surreal in a way. It's... Uh, it's magical because of the freedom of, of the forms he employed, uh, sculptural and uh, organic. Uh, it's some kind of a bio-architecture. Uh, and uh, it, it was built. It was built because those who take risks sometimes at least win. And the Chinese build anything. That's what I read. The Chinese, more than any other clients in the world, they build anything. You just make the proposal and they build it. This is the work he received the uh, uh, notorious, the important Sterling Prize in architecture for the Peckham Library. It's actually, in my opinion, not one of his really the most striking works, but maybe exactly because of it, got the award. Uh, I think Zaha Hadid got it twice. Uh, well, he got it once, this library. I like this celebration of the library very much, you know, because, uh, <laughs> because it doesn't look like a morose library at all. It's, 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 it's a library that stirs up your senses, so to speak, you know, the love of color, 
your imagination, although it's a rectangular elevation. But uh, you know, the 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 assume assuming the 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 field of colors helps. Yeah, I think uh, this elevation is the best part of the building. Uh, there are some interesting things at the interior as well, but not dramatically interesting, perhaps. Uh, although he had sculptural uh, abilities. And you have to, John Ruskin was right. To be a good architect, you have to, you have to, 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 to be either a painter or a sculptor. You have to have that because, because architecture is related to form. And uh, at best, it becomes an art. And uh, Lipskin said it, and Will also said it, and many other people said it. And those who try to sabotage and uh, you know uh, irritate and uh, interdict the artistic uh, expressions in architecture are wrong are wrong because then they will uh, fuel uh, histories of art where architecture will not be present and we don't want that do we this is in my opinion he, well not only in my opinion his best work the most outrageous and the most interesting and engaging the sharp, and uh, I'm glad it is called the sharp, the sharp center, Ontario College of Art and Design, again, Canada. And look at this, you know, now try to imagine that you are a student studying in this building. This building is telling you exactly what Lipskin said and what he himself said, take risks, live adventure, adventurously understand design and architecture and art in general as, a, as an adventure, because the building is adventurous, very much so. And again, I'm very happy that the Canadians uh, built it. And appropriately, no, it's, it's a design uh, college. It's, let's read again. It's the Sharp Center Ontario College of Art and Design. Bravo to them. And I can only envy them because this building is, uh, is uh, attempting to fly and it is attempting to generate in those who use it, the desire to fly, the desire to fly through imagination. This is what the building is, uh, is uh, attempting to encourage and evoke. Will also, the architect about uh, whom uh, 2000s uh, indifferences uh, didn't want to hear about today and yesterday and tomorrow and so on and so on forever. It's a good building, uh, bravo will also, bravo and bravo to, uh, to the Canadians who built it, housing. Uh, even in housing, he shows his uh, verve, artistic uh, verve. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, in, in housing is maybe a little bit less uh, easy than in, in some other uh, programs, you know, like uh, you honor like a museum or, you know, even a college of art. But even here, you know, look how he adorns the facade of the building with a big letter, which is maybe the name of this uh, part of the building, the presence of color, the shifting, the volumes that, uh, you know, uh, could irritate a mediocre uh, structural engineer. Uh, yeah, the city road proposal, 2007. What is this? A tower, which he didn't build. Uh, but look at it, it's psychedelic almost. A two bed was not built, but in my opinion, it would have been in more interesting than the skyscrapers by Daniel Lipskin. And I like the, the, the wild uh, abstract uh, uh, painting uh, of uh, on several floors, you know, uh, almost 10 floors height there. Uh, the man had imagination and, uh, you know, he expressed his imagination with courage and that's what, the student and the architect alike should do. Langfang, what's this? Another project by Will Alsop, 
uh, which didn't uh, get built. Now, he died at, um, I don't know, I think he was 70 years old or 71. Uh, he, you have to understand, he could have lived longer. And then maybe some of these projects would have become built works, but he died. But again, in a certain way, he took more risks than Daniel Lipskind. And maybe that's why he didn't build so much like Daniel Lipskind. Also, he didn't live so long and Lipskind is still with us. But look at this interior, you know, I, I don't think Lipskind could have done something like this. Although he had the talent and we saw it in his works for the Venice Biennial artworks. Now, I'll probably end this presentation. I didn't review it uh, this time, but uh, it's possible we are approaching the end of this presentation. Artworks by Will also. And in a way, they are kind of like his architecture. Of course, architecture compared to art per se appear to have some limits, but exactly because of those limits, architecture uh, derives from them um, uh, uh, particular uh, significance. It's important for an architect to express herself, himself, artistically as well. It's important. And not just through paintings or graphic works, but to express that artistic side also in the buildings. How else are we to differentiate between one building and, and another if we cripple ourselves by not expressing maybe our deepest nature? How? These are artworks by Will also, who left behind him. This is his legacy, his art, his buildings. The spiral is present, of course, in its becoming, eternal becoming, splashes of color, That's it. So that was it today.